More than 20 new laws were created to achieve that goal. On today's program, i like to discuss these laws relating to background checks and, and who is required to report suspected child abuse. Joining me to further examine, uh, to explain these measures is Representative Kathy Watson, Chair of the House Children and Youth Committee. Welcome. Thanks, Julie. Kathy. Well, Representative. Oh, well, <laughs> well, since we've known each other for years, <laughs> it's time. Julie and Kathy. Um, thank you for joining me and um, being on my show. Um, I, as I said, we, you really have been very, very busy in that committee. Number one, tell the, just to explain, because I know a lot of times when I go out in the district, I have to explain professional licensure. I'm chair of professional licensure, and they all look at me like, well, what do you do on professional <laughs> licensure? Uh, so can you explain a little bit in, in a little detail of what children and youth yes. actually the committee does? Certainly, as you well know, uh, bills are written by legislators along with very important staff because most of us are not <laughs> attorneys, so we need That's that. Right. St we need our staff, but very uh, good. Then the speaker directs when the bills are introduced what committee they go to, and there's usually, obviously, there's a reason for it. If the bill has to do particularly with improving the quality of life for children in Pennsylvania or youth, in other words, taking it up to about 18 and sometimes things that will affect college students mm -hmm. or those in that you know under 21 group uh, then it will come to the house children and youth committee that i have chaired last time the first two years session that was my first time and i am currently the chair i asked to continue and uh, because of the work that we are doing and much like you would say it overlaps and I think people need to know that we did 23 bills working with the Judiciary Committee, I should say, and Representative Marsico. But we really, the House did a lot of work. My committee, unbelievable amounts of work, extra time. Nothing seemed to be too much trouble for them because it dealt with children. That didn't mean that prior to you and I maybe being in the legislature in the 90s when laws had been last updated. People did a good job, but I think what we forget as legislators is that perpetrators and predators and people who will abuse and those who plain don't know but are terribly neglectful of children, causing children harm through their neglect, um, they kind of change their MO, if you will. Mm -hmm. They change how they operate. And we need laws that are perhaps flexible enough, or we go back and look at them frequently, that we update the law to fit what is going on in our society. And that's what I said. Actually, I think most of us think, all right, we did this work two years. We're good for 20 years or whatever, and not necessarily. So what had been in the 90s didn't hold and do well for us with some of the perpetrators that we encountered with child abuse in the 2000s, let's mm -hmm. say up to 2010. Mm -hmm. So that was what we took that on in the last two year session that we're going to update. And we really did it based on that task force report. And then you had your report uh, that you did. And I think it was almost the first time we had, well, we had a governor who commissioned the task force. You're the author, you were the commissioner for the report, but I knew you've tried that before to get it through. And it was as if somehow all this, I hate to say stars aligned, but finally the spotlight was there on it that you were able to get your legislation through. After Should have been years? done before <laughs> and maybe would have been, had it been done earlier, would have been at least helpful. The task force did a huge 412, if I remember my number correctly, page report on how do we upgrade and improve our child abuse and child neglect laws mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania to better protect children. So you deserve a lot of credit too for what you did and the fact that you have constantly been there shining that spotlight and saying, no, 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 you're missing the point. Things are going to change and we need to be proactive. So we were a little, not so pro, but we're there now and we'll just keep going. And I think you're doing a good job. And before we go on um, and I asked you some of these questions, I know I sat in on the county meeting and they are very pleased as to what is um, in the children uh, and youth department as uh, what has been going on here in Harrisburg and with the laws that have been 
um, implement it for that, child abuse and neglect. And that's good to know. Now, we did say in the committee that we figure we really should give them at least two years to work. And then what I've said, whether I'm there or somebody else is, then you need to go back and get feedback from everybody and say, okay, this was a really good idea, or this was an idea that came in your report or the task force report. We implemented it in legislation, but you know what? It doesn't work or, you know, we have an unintended consequence, so we need to fix that. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. If we've now gotten to the idea that it's, uh, kind of, or the legislation is organic in that it will grow and change a little and we need to be ready to go back and look at it simply because the issue doesn't seem to go away. It changes mm. and we need to be ready to adapt our laws to those changes so that those people, because previously everybody would sit there in court mm -hmm. where they brought an abuser in and the way the law was written, they would get away with it. Mm -hmm. And everybody sitting between the judge and the caseworker, and certainly the family of the child who was abused, they all knew, mm -hmm. but the law didn't help them. And the idea is that the law should be there to protect children. I should say to you, we did, and I don't know if you were going to ask it, we also were cognizant that we've had people over the years who have used the child abuse claim to hurt another individual. In other words, it wasn't founded and it wasn't grounded, but you, this is terrible in a divorce or something like mm -hmm. that where they're yes. against one another. So we increased penalties for knowingly doing that. Mm -hmm. Knowingly is the key word there, but in other words, that the child doesn't become the pawn in your anger against an ex-spouse or the neighbor or whatever, because that's, it's so damaging, we can't have that either. It should be because you report it because it really is, or you truly believe that what you saw is a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. I know, and that's why the child advocacy centers were so very important because they would resolve a lot of those issues within a matter of five days. They could determine whether or not it was, um, you know, as you said, uh, maybe a child uh, getting back at their parents and accusing them of, uh, of uh, abuse of whatever. Um, and in, when, once you get into that system, you can't get out. And that's why the child advocacy centers are so, so, so important. And I think uh, along with these new And you had something to do with that. Oh, yeah, but I'll <laughs> plug you even though you wouldn't, but you did. That was a, but that's a good thing. And what we're trying to do is get them across Pennsylvania, which you've done uh, with redirecting some money there, because the truth is it shouldn't be that depending on your zip code, if you get in this terrible position where there's abuse in your family, it shouldn't be that you have the best of a child advocacy center in some places, and, but and you that. don't have one in another. That's not fair to children. Well, that, that was the goal. So let me ask you a first question. Um, maybe you answered this, or um, maybe I didn't pick it up, but uh, uh, what prompted the creation of these new children? children well, I think... Laws? And we don't even like talking about it, and I don't yeah. like saying the name, but you remember that frighteningly celebrated case with uh, Sandusky. Yes. And that is so evil and so heinous, but something good had to come out of it. And the thought was, when they looked at it and looked at how could someone operate for a long time, the laws didn't uh, seem to help and didn't help people to get people like this off the street. So in some ways that did, that prompted, from what I understood, Governor Corbett to set up the task force on child protection and staff it with people who actually knew and understood, district attorneys who work with child abuse, uh, pediatricians whose whole career was, was dealing with children who had been abused, um, all kinds of people, psychologists, who worked with children who were abused. Mm -hmm. And again, together, they took hearings all around the state and produced this report on what needed to change in Pennsylvania law. Mm -hmm. And it was from that, I call it the blueprint, that's what we worked on and developed essentially what became 23 different laws, probably the one that people talk about the most because it affects everybody, if you will, the vast majority, would be the one that was Representative Mao's bill on background checks. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about that, that actually um, 
Sandusky had been, I talked to some people who were reporters at that time, and he had been, they sent something, uh, there had been a complaint against him. It had gone to the district attorney's office. Now, it, it didn't become a crime or all that, but it would have been in a background check if background checks had been done at that time, and it would have kind of red flagged. Mm -hmm. So when people say, well, they don't, background checks don't catch people or whatever, they do catch some. Uh, what they mainly do is they say to a perpetrator or predator who hasn't been caught but has been, I don't think I want to go there. I don't want to be that school bus driver. Or I don't want to be the Sunday school teacher or whomever it might be because I have to get, I have to go through a background check and I don't want them having my records. I, you know, I operate best, which is what they do. Okay. I call it in the shadows. And in effect, what background checks do is put sunlight on all the kids and they don't like that. So law enforcement has said to us and said to the task force that that was an integral piece of just changing the way we view children in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and kind of saying to everybody, hands off our children. Right, and, and, and if there is a, a, an abuse, um, how do you define abuse? I mean, what, what do you look for as far as abuse? And, and please also explain uh, to the viewers, I know we have mandatory um, reporters out there and they kind of work hand in hand as reporting abuse, correct? Mm -hmm. So can you kind of touch on, you know, define abuse and what, how the mandatory um, reporters, what, uh, what okay. their job well, is to define, do? Well, we define, I mean, child abuse can be physical abuse, we define. We defined it as emotional abuse, and verb, which is part of verbal abuse. Um, and I think the one that is so heinous and so distasteful, most of us don't sit around and ever have a conversation about this because we have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews and you don't want to think about it. Uh, and that would be sexual abuse. Mm. And that's all defined in the law. We also talk about really uh, neglect. Now that doesn't mean that you know you forgot to ask your kids to brush their teeth or you, you were sick that day so you didn't get all the clothes washed. Mm -hmm. We're talking about where children really aren't fed, uh, aren't watched or taken care of, some really serious cases. People that aren't sure what they're watching and saying, is that abuse? You know, if, if he just hit him one time and it wasn't that, is that abuse? Uh, they certainly have a couple places to go because we'll talk about mandatory reporters, which just like the word says, you have a legal obligation by the nature of the work you do or the position you're in, even a volunteer, to report mm -hmm. abuse. But we've talked about, and the task force did, and I know you and I have talked about it, that we would like to see a time when everybody is more knowledgeable about what constitutes abuse or neglect and that they at least report what they see when they are so uncomfortable and they're a fairly good judge mm -hmm. and they report it and let the professionals investigate and see what's going on. Mainly to, for the protection of children, as the task force says, not necessarily the convenience of the adults. So they could, right now, you could go to a website. It's called keepkidssafe.pa.gov. That's keepkidssafe.pa.gov. Dot pa dot gov. They have a whole list of like frequently asked questions. What constitutes child abuse? What are you seeing? What might you do? And they will always refer you that if you think what you've witnessed is real neglect or abuse, that you can call Childline. Now, Childline is a dedicated phone line with professionals at the other end. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. They're not revealing your identity, but what they want to know, I mean, they'll ask you yours because it's a real report, but they don't report you to the other uh, person or family involved. But what they're professional in that they'll ask a lot of questions to see and get from, tell me what you saw, tell me what you think, this, that, and the other, for them to help determine where does this go? Does it go to the local police department? How do we then pass it on? Now, the number for Childline, that's 1-800-932-0313. That's been in place, but they've actually, in light of what we've done and trying to get more people aware and more people understanding, they've staffed that, they've added more professionals to that line to take calls. 
So again, it's 1-800-932-0313. Mm -hmm. uh, but that you can find out more. Mandatory reporters, they're the people we often think of. That's the camp counselor. That's the school teacher. Um, that's the person that um, <clears throat> in the daycare center. Mm -hmm. They're mandatory reporters because they do have an ongoing supervisory, supervisory, I can say it, relationship with children who are in their care. And so they're required to report what they see or what the child tells them. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, I think we can get to a place where we all care about our children. Mm -hmm. I said, if you wake up people at three o'clock in the morning and go, you know, how do you feel about children? Now, they may be annoyed you woke them up, <laughs> but they're surely, they love their children. You know, that's right there. But it's knowing what to do with that. And what do I do? I think for most people, they don't report because they don't know what to do and they aren't sure what they saw. Mm -hmm. And if we all get to be a little more knowledgeable, we understand what would be abuse and what is probably ongoing. Let's take a quick break. Legislative Report will return in a moment. Did you know that Fort Indian Town Gap, located in Lebanon County, is home to Pennsylvania's only Veterans Memorial? C.J. Frederick of Westchester, Bucks County, submitted the winning design that now honors those men and women who have sacrificed their lives in defending this great country. Dedicated to the Commonwealth on October 7, 2001, the Veterans Memorial is surrounded by freestanding walls and houses an amphitheater, which can accommodate large crowds during an event. Strategically placed in the front of the amphitheater is a tomb that reminds visitors of those who gave their lives protecting the freedoms of this nation. The design suggests a war-damaged structure in which Frederick wanted to impress upon those visiting the horrific arena of war. Now you know. Did you know the Avenue of Flags presentation at Indian Town Gap National Cemetery has over 500 casket flags? Among the flags displayed are Commonwealth, Territorial, and Military flags. The flags are tied to 20-foot poles spaced 40 feet apart on both sides of the main drive of the cemetery. It takes about two hours to set up and take down all of the flags. Volunteers are encouraged to help with this task and must be at least 13 years of age. All of the flags are donated to the Avenue of Flags by families of the deceased. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. I'm State Representative Julie Harhart. My guest is Representative Kathy Watson. We're discussing child protection in Pennsylvania, a bill that Will will probably be working on today or have been working on. Um, and it's a fix to Act 153, and that's who, um, and dealing with volunteers, and when do they need to get a, um, a clearance uh, background check? Uh, this has caused an awful lot of confusion in my area. I think in most areas in Pennsylvania, there seems to have been more misinformation than actual information. Again, I have to reiterate and say, if you go to that website, keepkidssafe.pa.gov, they delineate you know, who, what kind of a background check, what do you need, and who would need it. Certainly the neighbor that volunteers and says, that's up to you as a parent, yes, I would use that, or wowie, Mrs. Watson, you know, she's a nice lady, but she can't keep up with my three, and I would probably turn her down, whatever. That would be your, your that's choice. Your call. Mm -hmm. Right, that's your call, and it doesn't involve a background check. I use the example, but we know that, of course, those who are employed, the teacher needs the background check. And the school district has that, but we set up a general rule of thumb for those who need background checks that they get that child abuse clearance with the uh, Department of Human Services, and then they also get a background check with our state police. And if indeed they've lived in Pennsylvania for 10 years, 
they don't need to get that federal background check that people worry about. It's a little more expensive to begin with, but it also involves being fingerprinted. Now, the one thing we can't do is if your employer says, I'm sorry, but to work for us, you have to have all three clearances and you have to have that federal, we can't supersede what any private employer does. But I would like to say we've set the field to say we would be comfortable and people would be comfortable if we get background checks for many of these people. Mm -hmm. Then we get to the volunteers and then we get to the definition that yes, you're a volunteer, but do you have that ongoing, regular kind of responsibility where you're in a supervisory position for children? Children, if you want to think of it, they look up to you, you are in charge. In that case, maybe you are the Sunday school teacher or the CCD teacher, if it's in, in a religious context, or the Boy Scout leader or the assistant scout master or whatever, then you would have a back, you would have to get the background checks. But for example, on the campus, whether I'm in college or whatever, and I'm the lady who works in the cafeteria who makes dynamite pancakes in the morning, and when your daughter comes through, I do learn her name, so I say, and I hand her her pancakes almost every day, and I say something nice because I like my job and I, I, I'm nice to the kids. Do I need a background check? I'm sort of seeing her regularly, but I have no supervisory control over her. Okay. I, I'm not in charge of her in any ongoing way. So then I wouldn't need the background check. I think where the problem came in is that because some people didn't read 153, and maybe our language needs to be more precise, which is what we're doing in the bill you referenced, 1276, but they weren't sure, so they went to a lawyer or whoever, or their insurance, and we said, uh, I don't know, everybody get them. And I think of our fire companies, for example, all, most of them, many of them, all volunteer. They have junior firefighters, mm -hmm. and these men, young men and women are 15, 16, 17 years old. Does everybody in the fire company? No. Maybe the two or three people whose job it is to teach them, to test them, and all of that and report to um, you know, the president of the fire company or the fire chief that they've passed all their tests. Those two or three people who are in charge of them, they need the background checks. But if I'm out, we're fighting a fire together and I'm feeding a, the line and the person next to me is 16 years old, I don't need the background check. But again, we heard kind of the misinformation, everybody get them. And I, that was never, you know, our legislative intent. What's our intent? The intent is that the background checks does afford an additional layer of protection, nothing's 100%, and does say to those who would be perpetrators or predators or do harm to our children under the age of 18, hands off. Mm -hmm. So. I've heard people say, well, you can't promise. No, we certainly can't promise that this fixes everything. Nothing is better than a family's diligence in protecting and watching over the children they are raising. Mm -hmm. I just, that's the best. So, but so we are doing some things that will assist families in protecting their children. So uh, let's just, to, to say that if you are a school teacher and around children all the time, definitely need a background check. But if I'm the homeroom mother just coming in and the teacher's in the room, I don't need a background, you know, I'm or showing you, up. Or if you're going into the school just to read for the day. Well, you, you and I do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of my favorite things, especially I mean, when, you go to the, <laughs> when you go to the preschool because they're so nice and they, you know, um, and all of that. But technically, we don't need it. Now, I went because I have um, interns in the summer. They're not paid because we don't have any money for that. They're usually high school students mm -hmm. who want to come in. They want to see what it's all about. Or they can use it for uh, write a letter later, and they use it for some of their community service hours that they have to do. Right. So technically, but I thought, you know what? You have to lead by example. You can go online to that same kid keepkidssafe.pa.gov and you can do your background check stuff online and get it returned to you. I figured, you know what, be a part of the system and go with it. If and when we have interns this summer, I'm ready, I've done it. Hmm. So have you heard an outburst from the public on this because of this confusion? I, and oh, once, sure. And once this bill 
hopefully, well, I'm sure it's going to be um, signed into law, will clarify all the, will answer the questions. Yes, it should. We hope so. Uh, and as I said, and then we could give it essentially that two-year run where we'll have to come back and say, is there something that we did that right. was an unintended consequence? Then we'll have to fix that. Uh, but I think people will get used to the fact of a background check. They won't think so much about it. Mm -hmm. It's something different for some people. And they're already, you know, it's like worrying. But I can tell you that um, Department of Human Services said to us, that's why they hired more people and did, they had a crush of volunteers. The law went to effect December 31st. Mm -hmm. And people have time. If they have it, they have till, you know, 2016, or they have till the end of July, or, I get confused. I think it's July 31st, not the 1st. But in any event, this time, if they're getting a new one, they were all there. They had like 60,000 people who applied in uh, January and February. So Pennsylvanians want to do the right thing. They want to protect their children. And I feel that we're on the right track and we're going to do it. Uh, now, the governor has weighed the fees for child abuse clearances uh, for the state police background uh, checks. What about those who have already gone through that process and paid their fees? Is that going to create that a problem? Is, wow, that's out of my call. Oh. <laughs> you know, in the sense that I'm not sure what would happen there. In other words, those 60,000 people who in January and February maybe went online and got the, uh, the Department of Human Services check and then the state police check. So they've paid their $20, 10 for each. I don't know what they're going to do. I know that you have to remember that, and you know that, that when we do a law, it is prospective. That is, the law is going forward from this date, and there's nothing in it that would be retrospective. So that would have to be something separate that somebody would decide to do. I don't know how they'll handle that. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> the governor, we yeah, will find out. We will find that out. So before you leave today, Kathy, and we only have a, about a minute to go yet, um, is there any other legislation in Children and Youth uh, Committee that you're working on um, that you can share with us? Well, quickly, we certainly are, we've moved into the area of adoption because one of the things that we found out that people who want to create their families and, uh, and want to do it through adoption, they go out of state, they yes. go to other states. Countries. Because, <laughs> uh, right, because it's so difficult to do in Pennsylvania with the law. So we're doing kind of a mini task force reviewing that to see how do we encourage Pennsylvania families to adopt Pennsylvania children who are available for adoption. I think that's a, a good um, task force to put in forth because you're right, adoption is very difficult. Why we make it so difficult to adopt children in Pennsylvania, I'll never know. Uh, that's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Julie Harhart. If you need assistance with any state government matters, feel free to contact me at my local office. The address and the number will be shown in a moment. Thanks for watching and please join me next time for legislative report.